If you want to work on microbiome research, you have to interact with bioinformaticians. One of the good or bad things about microbiota papers is that they rely on graphics because these pictures convey a lot of information. The first thing you have to do is understand the graphing methods used and what the underlying theoretical analyses actually are. If you can use PubMed, you can find out about bacterial taxonomy because there is a simple pull-down menu. Instead of PubMed, you change to taxonomy. And if somebody talks about Ackermansia, you can simply put Ackermansia into that search window and find out the complete taxonomy of Escherichia coli. And you can use that at any level. It's also possible to represent the microbiota as, as pie charts. And this can be done at either phylum level, where we're comparing the microbiota of the young and the old, and you can also drill down and look at the composition at genus level. Typically, if you want to get a nice paper out or to extract the meaning from a nice paper, you have to be comfortable at at least genus level of taxonomic division. Another common way to represent microbiota are what some people call stack graphs or bar graphs. These bar graphs are useful if there is a significant change in the microbiota. And using a bar graph method, it's not possible to show the variation within each treatment group. And sometimes the variation within each treatment group makes the difference in the microbiota between groups not statistically significant. When you compare microbiota composition before or after treatment, it's necessary to adjust your statistical comparison for multiple tests, alpha and beta diversity. And these are useful descriptions of microbial communities. So they are generally methods of measuring ecological communities and habitats. They're typically applied to microbiota composition data measured by 16 and analysis. A reduction in microbiota diversity in previously healthy people is reliably an indicator of a loss of health. But excessive microbiota diversity in healthy people is usually a sign that the microbiota community is going to change, and it's usually not a good change. Alpha diversity could be your gut microbiota. So gamma comparisons are between groups of individuals. So for alpha diversity to measure the microbiota in one person, we have the number of observed species, Shannon diversity and phylogenetic diversity, and later on I'll talk about beta diversity. What happens is that you put these sequences through a bioinformatic pipeline and you put them into groups if they're 97% related to each other. Because classically, microbiologists have said that bacteria that have a 16S sequence that's 97% identical are the same species. An OTU is simply a sequence-based bacterial species definition. We used to think that each person had around 2,500 species because our initial estimates were based on inaccurate PCR methodologies. And thanks again to Jeffrey Gordon and Rob Knight, we now know that the number of species in one person is actually surprisingly small. It's typically between 150 and 200 species per person. Shannon diversity is uh, a mathematical measure which uses a slightly different um, methodology. And it's based on the OTU count. And you will see it represented in papers where the range of indices is typically from two to five. Composition is also important and function is important, but hopefully you'll remember that graphic example that small differences in the number of the Shannon diversity index can make a big difference for the biology of the person carrying or receiving that microbiota. Phylogenetic diversity is a way of summarizing the microbiota and showing how diverse it is based on the phylogeny. All of the colored lines, and this is obviously very simplified, indicate its microbiota. 
And the simple message is that it's covering lots of branches of the tree. The microbiota covers a broad phylogenetic range. In comparison, the person in the lower diagram, all of its microbiota is residing on one branch of the tree. So this is an index which indicates the phylogenetic diversity. And typically, a good microbiota with lots of function has a wide phylogenetic diversity. If you look at the graphic representing that, on the top right we have a simplified theoretical microbiota comprising 10 OTUs, numbered 1 to 10 from top to bottom, 10 different bacterial species. We've got two people who are colored in blue and red, and the color designation is that each color is sitting alongside each of the OTUs. So all of the OTUs are present in both of the subjects and the unifrac distance is zero, meaning that two people have an identical microbiota, which is highly unlikely. Then if we consider a more extreme variation of the same case, we've got two individuals, one person has OTUs 1 to 5, and the second person has OTUs 6 to 10. In other words, none of the OTUs are shared. And when we look at, the, at that on a, on a phylogenetic tree, we can calculate this unifrac distance, and it comes out as 1.0. Zero means totally identical microbiota, and one means totally dissimilar. And these graphs, the first thing to realize is that each circle is a sample. And if two samples have the exact same microbiota, they're on top of each other, because the unifrac distance is zero. So the distance between circles in these plots is a reflection of how dissimilar the samples are from each other. As they get further apart, the microbiota is more dissimilar. And now it starts to become interesting because when you impose the color scheme on this, the green is the oral cavity and the blue is the gut, and this is the skin and the external auditory meatus. So you can, you can see from these comparisons that the gut microbiota is different from the oral microbiota, whereas all of the skin-based samples uh, are quite close to each other. People living in the community, 95% of them are in this bottom left quadrant of the graph, whereas most of the residential care subjects are very separate, suggesting that where you live determines your microbiota type. There are two ways of doing this analysis, unweighted and weighted. It's all unifrac. It's all based on a phylogenetic comparison of the microbiota in all the samples. In the unweighted graph, you pay no attention to the fact that some of the OTUs may be very rare. And that accentuates the difference between them because if you look at the weighted unifrac analysis, the difference between the red and green circles is, what is much less. Looking, doing an unweighted analysis is important because you can see the contribution of low abundance taxa. The take home message is if you're not sure, should I use weighted or unweighted, use both. Another technique which is commonly used is a heat map. Now, this is an example taken from a study we did with uh, Danilo Arcalini from the University of Napoli. So how these graphics work is that across the top of the graph, we have the people. So there are 150 people, and if this was a little better focused, you should be able to see there are 150 columns, and these are the people grouped according to their microbiota. Along this axis here, we have dietary ingredients, and along this, we have their microbiota types, what bacteria they contain. Now, the heat map is a way of showing the relative abundance of bacteria and microbiota types and ingredients at the same time. So this is a nice way of showing two data types clustering based on one of them, and the heat map is a finesse which allows you to show the abundance either way of the two data types. And you're going to see this more and more in microbiota papers. Microbiota studies are still in their early days, so 
many of us are making genuine mistakes as we go along. So, so you have to be critical of all aspects of the paper. So you need to look at the clinical definition of the people in the study. Um, you also have to have controls. Are the controls well matched? Where are they coming from? Sometimes we take healthy controls from the spouse of the patient. And you often find that the spouse is suffering some of the symptoms of the patient or that if it's a functional gastrointestinal disorder, that family may have a very different diet to accommodate the patient. So you, it's good to find out where the controls are coming from. You have to be careful about confounding variables and whether or not they're addressed. If they're IBS patients, have they been taking uh, dietary interventions? If you're collaborating with somebody, you may want to either receive samples for microbiota analysis or you might want to send samples. Maybe you're in a clinical center and there's a collaborator in another city and you want to send them samples. You have to know how samples should be collected and frozen and stored. And lastly, you should probably consult with an expert before you do these studies because there are technical decisions about how the microbiota should be studied and um, you need to decide if you can afford to do either compositional sequencing or shotgun sequencing. You should also talk to an expert about sequence coverage. This is governed to a small degree on how much money you have. You need to decide on a reference 16S gene catalog and there are competing kinds. If you're going to do shotgun sequencing, you need to have a gene catalogue and there are competing kinds. And lastly, you need a bioinformatics pipeline. As I said, bioinformatics is not something that can be done part-time by a postgrad who is also collecting samples. To do top-end research on microbiota analysis, you need dedicated people who at the very least have been trained in a lab which does this full time. It's really not possible for a postgrad to do it part time in a lab which is mainly focusing on nutrition. Thank you very much.